triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And uh, by the time we parted, we were looking at uh, the first stages of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we had just said that the word triumph means and so the triumphant entry to Jerusalem was uh, the triumphal entry was about Jesus' victory, victory, victory. He was entering Jerusalem as a victor. And there are certain things that happened during that entry that are important uh, for our study as candidates preparing for exams. And so I want us to look at uh, the events around that. The, the, the question I asked last time was, who are these disciples that were sent by Jesus to get a cult? A cult. Remember, he rode on a cult, which are some other Bibles called donkey. So he read on and some other books also called us. So Jesus was riding on a cult. But who, who are these disciples that were sent on a cult? The Bible just says two disciples. It is silent on who they were. Some scholars say it was a... It was a Okay. It was um, Peter and John. Uh, some scholars mm -hmm. it was Peter and John, but it is not clear from the Bible who the two disciples were. But all in all, they were sent to get a cult. And uh, the instruction was, if the owner of the cult asks, tell him the master wants it. So we now discuss the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, the word triumph, as we've said, means victory or success. And Jesus was entering Jerusalem in that way as the expected Messiah. Remember, he was the, 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 the Jews for a long time had been waiting for a Messiah. So he was entering as the expected Messiah. Now, this triumphant entry into Jerusalem was prophesied by Zechariah. So he was entering in this manner to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah, the prophet. Zechariah. And uh, Zechariah said that the king will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey's back. The king will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey's back. That was prophet Zechariah. And so what Jesus was doing was fulfilling prophecy. Was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. So let us look at the events that took place during the triumphant entry. <laughs> events that took place during the triumphant entry. Please don't turn on your camera. The events that took place during the triumphal entry. The events that took place. Event number one. Event number one. Jesus entered Jerusalem from the name he entered triumphantly. Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly. Triumphantly. Number two, we say that Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. That Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. And that is the verse that all of you know. What does it say? Jesus Wept. wept. Yes, he wept over Jerusalem, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, that no stone will be left standing on top of the other. And so Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Now, number three, now uh, Jesus rode on a donkey's back. 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 Number four. Is it number four now? The people sang and rejoiced. 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 And so let us look at the book of Luke chapter 
19 and verse 41 to 44. The book of Luke, chapter 19, verse uh, 41 to 44. Remember the time when you're discussing CRE, we use the book of Luke. Huh? So the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 41 to 44. What do we say? What does it say? What's the Bible? Yes, Brittany. Brittany? Yes. Read. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, yes. He came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but you, can not, but you cannot see it, the time will come when your enemies will surround you with barricades, blockades, you will, you and close in on your, on you from every side. They will completely destroy you and the people within your walls. Not a single stone will they leave in its place. Because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. Hmm. So Jesus with Jerusalem. And, he, he, and, and you see, when he's talking about Jerusalem, he's, uh, he's talking about a time of destruction coming upon Jerusalem. Primarily because Jesus, they did not recognize their salvation. So Jesus wept. Now, the people spread palm leaves and clothes on the ground. People spread palm leaves, palm leaves and clothes on the ground. The people spread palm leaves and clothes on the ground. The people spread palm leaves and clothes on the ground. The people... spread palm leaves and clothes on the ground. Yes. Are you there? Yes. yes. And we are going to the book of Luke 19, 28. Yes. Luke 19, 28. Luke 19, 28. Let us get the whole story. Luke 19, 28. Luke 19, 28. Hey. Are you there? Yes. Yes, if you're there. Who is there? Who is there? Me. Me is uh purity. In uh you start from uh, twenty-eight. It says when he had he, he had said this, he went on ahead going as when he drew near to Beth Faith and Bethany at the mountain called Oliver that he sent two of his disciples. They go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you, you will find a, a gold tide on which no one has ever sat. Lose it and bring it here. 
Continue. Uh, and if anyone and if anyone asks you why are you losing it, thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went the the Yahweh and found it just as he, he had said to them. Good. And you continue. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd told him, Teacher, order the disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if this were silent, the stones would shout. So they spread their clothes and cloaks, but some also spread palm leaves on the ground. Number five, is it number five now? There was singing and dancing. There was singing and dancing as the people praised God. There was singing and dancing as the people praised God. There was singing and dancing as people praised God. Some of the events that took place Jesus was entering Jerusalem. And remember, by that time, the, the, the Pharisees were observing him keenly. Even as they were telling him to order his disciples to shut up, you know, yes. observing him yes. because they thought that this was the time when he was now going to to to, to do what to carry out the coup, to carry out the coup. Cool. Uh, at that time, and so from, can hear you. yes, <laughs> to the Christian lessons learned from the triumphal entry. The Christian lessons learned from the triumphal entry. The Christian lessons, Honorina, Honorina, Honorina. Can this Honorina hear us? The Christian lessons learned from the triumphal entry. The Christian lessons we learned from the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so let us continue from there and discuss. Number one, we learned that Jesus is the peaceful Messiah. That was the significance of the palm leaves. It was a sign of peace. So Jesus is the peaceful Messiah. One, Jesus is the peaceful Messiah. He's the peaceful Messiah. Number two. Number two. Number two. We learn that Jesus is the savior of all mankind. That Jesus is the savior of all mankind. Jesus is the savior of all mankind. And we also learn that we should show humility. Remember, Jesus was a king. He was a, he was a son of God, but he traveled on a donkey. And the reason he was traveling on that donkey was to show humility. And therefore, Christians learn that they should be humble, that they should show humility, that they should show humility, so that Christians should show humility. Christians should show humility. And uh, finally, that Jesus was the expected Messiah, that Jesus was the expected 
Messiah. And once you've looked at uh, the Christian lessons we learned from the triumphal entry children, then now allow me to go to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. And the first thing we begin with talking about the Lord's Supper is the other names of the Lord's Supper. How else do we call the Lord's Supper today? Which are the other names that Christians use to refer to the Lord's Supper? One such name is uh, the Last Supper. We also call it the Holy Communion. Some call it the Holy Eucharist. Others call it the Lord's Table. All right? There are those who call it the Holy Communion. The Holy Communion. To commune. Because it is to commune with each other and with God. To commune. To fellowship with each other and with God. Therefore, some call it Holy Communion. Others call it the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist, especially the Catholics call it the Holy Eucharist. Now others call it the Last Supper. The Last Supper. Others still call it the Lord's Table. The Lord's Table. But all of it refers to one thing, that is the Lord's Supper. And according to the Jewish tradition, the Lord's Supper was celebrated during Passover. During Passover. And remember, the first Passover was celebrated in the land of Egypt. The, 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 the very first Passover was celebrated in the land of Egypt when the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites as it went ahead to kill the, the Egyptian firstborns. And so um, during the, first, uh, the, the, the Passover celebration, Christians commemorate the Israelites commemorated the, the angel of death passing over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, but Christians also uh, use it to commemorate, uh, commemorate, uh, uh, commemorate um, the same. And now let us go to uh, how Christians prepare how Christians prepare. Remember during this Passover time, we have a very important period called the Easter period, isn't it? And so let us look at how Christians prepare for Easter. During this time, we have the period that we call Easter. So how do Christians prepare for Easter? How do Christians prepare for Easter? So Christians today prepare for Easter by one, repenting their sins. That is repentance of their sins repentance of their sins. Number two, they, uh, repentance of their sins. And number two, through fasting and praying, fasting and praying. And number three, through uh, forgiveness, that is forgiving each other, forgiveness of each other, forgiveness of each other. So we prepare for Easter by repenting ourselves, by forgiving those who have offended us, and by fasting and praying. It is worth noting or remembering that the Lord's Supper was prepared by two disciples. That was Peter and? Peter and? John. And John, correct. It was prepared by Peter and John, and it was attended by 13 people. It was attended by 13 people, inclusive of Jesus, that is. So let us look at the event that took place during the Lord's Supper. What took place during that supper? The events that took place during the Lord's Supper. Events, the particular events that took place during the Lord's Supper. The events that took place during the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm during the Lord's Supper. Which events took place? Number one, we've said that this uh, Lord's Supper was prepared by two disciples, that is Peter and John. Now, during the supper, one, Jesus broke the bread. Jesus broke the bread. Jesus broke the bread. Jesus broke the bread. The bread, yes? Okay. Jesus broke the bread. Jesus, number two. Number two. 
Number two. Auntie. Who is that? Who is that who needs uh, clobbering? Honorina. Honorina, you are calling auntie. <laughs> Mute yourself. No. Mute yourself, Madam Honorina. Serve mute. I can see that you are on. You are not mute. mute you from this end. Now you are mute. So number two. Number two. The disciples ate bread and drank wine. So there was eating of bread and drinking of wine. The disciples ate bread and drank wine. The disciples ate bread and drank wine. The disciples ate bread and drank wine. Number three, during the Lord's Supper, Jesus blessed the meals, blessed the bread, and blessed the wine. So Jesus blessed the meal. Jesus blessed the meal. Jesus blessed the meal. Number four. Number four. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Number five, Jesus talked about his betrayer. He talked about his betrayer. Who was amongst them as they had their, their meal, their Passover meal? So Jesus talked about his betrayer. And remember that the Lord's Supper took place in Jerusalem. It took place in Jerusalem when the Passover was near. It took place in Jerusalem. And now we go to the book of Luke chapter 22 and verse, uh, uh, I think verse 7 onwards. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Luke chapter 22, Verse 7. Uh, start from verse 14. Huh? Verse 14. Yes, who is ready? From verse 14. From verse 14. Verse 14. If you're not ready, I will read. And I read. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again. Uh, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in uh, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Okay, so he was praying, but the hand of him who is going to betray you to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays me! Now they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So he spoke about his betrayer in the Bible. And he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he blessed the cup, and he prayed for the meal. 
So from there, let us look at the significance of all those activities. The significance of all those activities that Jesus performed. Why did he perform them? Number one, the breaking of bread signified the crucifixion and suffering of Jesus Christ, the body. The breaking of bread signified the crucifixion and suffering of the body. The crucifixion and suffering of Jesus Christ. That is the breaking of bread. It signified, Emily, right, stop yawning. Emily is yawning too much. You're going to swallow that, this computer. <laughs> it signified, breaking of bread signified the crucifixion and suffering of the body of Jesus Christ. That is uh, uh, breaking of bread. Eating of bread reminded Christians of the body of Christ. Eating of bread reminds Christians. It's to remind the Christians of the body. That is why he says, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is the blood. This is the bread. This is my body which is given up for you and for all so that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. So it, it signifies the remembrance. It reminds the Christians of the body of Christ. Drinking of wine. Drinking of wine is to remind Jesus of the blood. Remind Christians of the blood of Jesus Christ. Remind Jesus of the blood of the Christians of the blood of Jesus Christ. Then washing of the disciples' feet. Washing of the disciples' feet was to show service to others and humility. Service to others and humility. Washing of the disciples' feet was to show service to others and humility. Service to others and humility. That is washing of the disciples' feet is to show service to others and humility. Service to others and humility. Any question? Any question? Any question? Now we have uh, three minutes before the break. Let's, let's wind up with the Lord's Supper before we take the break. Let's go to lessons Christians learn from the Lord's Supper. Brittany, why are you singing? Lessons Christians learn from the Lord's Supper. Brittany is singing a song. Let's Say me have not sung. I saw you singing. She was not singing. Let's plan from the Lord's Supper. Number one, Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. Number one, Jesus yeah, too far. is the Son of God. He is the Son of God, Yaoko. Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. Remember, John calls him the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so you sing, Oh, lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy, have mercy on us. So it's the lamb of God. He's the sacrificial lamb of God. Number three, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. Number four, Christians should show humility. Christians should show humility. And number five, Christians should serve others. Number four. Pardon, number three. Number three, we've said Christ, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God. Huh? Number three, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah, okay. the Savior. He is the sacrificial lamb of God. Christians should serve others and Christians should show humility. Christians should show humility. Now, girls, I want us to take a short break now of uh, three minutes. And immediately Gosh. after the break, we start discussing the arrests of Jesus. 
the arrest of Jesus now. So I want us to take a break. After the break, we start discussing the arrest of Jesus, and that is at exactly 12.25. 12.25. See you on the other side of the break, Brittany. Sure. Other side of the break. Yeah. Sure. Bogomba. Yes. We are joining at 1225. 1225. 12? 25. 25. 25. <laughs> Today is my birthday. Whose birthday is it? Mine. Veran. <laughs> yes. We'll talk about it after the... Anuka, Anuka, watch. <laughs> 